afternoon and welcome back to Never Is Now, ADL's signature summit on anti-Semitism and hate. I'm pleased to be the moderator for this discussion on a key topic of ADL's international affairs agenda, anti-Semitism across borders. For decades, we've seen anti-Semitism from a variety of sources. Anti-Semitism is an ideological fixture of the far right, the far left, and radical Islamism. Anti-Semitism also stems from bias against those who are different, those who are looking for a scapegoat, or just out of ignorance. The advent of social media, however, has allowed anti-Semitic rhetoric to spread, both by ideologues pushing an agenda of hate and by people with biases who share anti-Semitic statements or memes. And that spread knows no borders. ADL published a groundbreaking report on one of the most dangerous aspects of this phenomenon exactly a year ago. The report titled Hate Beyond Borders, the Internationalization of White Supremacy, looked at surging violence in the US, Europe, and beyond, motivated by elements of white supremacy. The report analyzed how white supremacist killers influence and inspire one another and how European and American adherents are learning from each other, supporting each other, and reaching new audiences. It was written in cooperation with leading European extremism researchers from the UK, Germany, France, Poland, and Sweden. Today, we're going to look at how anti-Semitic rhetoric appears in three countries, Germany, the UK, and Chile, and to discuss commonalities across borders both to the U.S. and among those countries. We're privileged to have four excellent panelists for this discussion. Kim will speak on the far right and Islamist anti-Semitism in Germany. Dave will speak on the far left anti-Semitism in the U.K. Sophia will speak on the uh, main, main aspects of anti-Semitism in Chile. And Marilyn on our Hate Beyond Borders report. Afterwards, we will discuss common themes and even extremist cooperation across borders. So with that, we'll start with May Marilyn. Marilyn, if you could set us off, please, by going over some of the main findings of the report um, that we published last year at ADL, and if you could set the stage for us, please. Sure, uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am you know, very excited to participate in this international panel. Uh, today and to discuss these these issues with my uh, esteemed colleagues from abroad. And uh, that is because I'll just say at the very start that the only way to combat global anti-Semitism is through global participation and monitoring and also, you know, and exposing extremists and anti-Semites. Uh, as Sharon said, about a year ago, uh, we re ADL released a joint report on international white supremacy with, with colleagues, um, as Sharon mentioned, in, in France, Sweden, Germany, Poland, and the UK. And at that time, um, we saw that there was an uptick in interaction between white supremacists in the US and Europe, and that there were a number of influencers in various countries that were actually pushing people towards extremism. So our research showed that European and American extremists are actually interacting in many different ways. And, and, you know, also, as Sharon said, learning from each other and supporting each other. So you have um, extremists who are certainly interacting online, uh, but you also have people who are meeting in person, in conferences, um, or at conferences. Obviously, this was, this was before the pandemic. Um, but we see that... Um, you know, our research, uh, you know, showed that um, because it's so easy to communicate across borders, uh, obviously through social media and other means, that uh, these influencers that, you know, were different in different countries, um, these are, you know, people who um, whose works are known to, um, let's say, white supremacists in various countries, and that would be people like Kevin McDonald, who's an anti-Semite, a well-known anti-Semite in the U.S., David Duke, who's a well-known anti-Semite, uh, Jared Taylor, another one. Uh, these people travel around, but they also have online sites which give information. 
And we know that the people that they especially reach are young white males. Um, and many of these young white males think it's funny to post awful memes um, and disturbing memes about, uh, for example, pushing Jews into ovens. And they promote this kind of bigoted humor. So, you know, what we, what we saw is that um, the fact that they have access to all kinds of social media allows this easy dissemination of, of, of this, you know, um, ideology that's anti-Semitic, that's racist. And we have seen, um, for example, a number of neo-Nazi groups like Adam Waffen and the Fuhrer Creek Division form online uh, with members from all over the world and, you know, that interact regularly, but it's not just online activity that concerns us. Uh, these online interactions often lead to real world incidents. So, you know, over the past decade, we've seen a surge in violence in the United States and Europe and elsewhere. And, you know, these incidents are motivated by, by anti-Semitism and racism and, and anti-Muslim sentiment and anti-immigration sentiment. And, what you know what happens when a white supremacist uh like robert bowers kills 11 people in a synagogue in pittsburgh or you know brenton tarrant another white supremacist kills 51 people in mosques in um you know in new zealand well you know other ex extremists around the world revel in these acts and you know in these acts of violence and they see them as a as a kind of victory and they also feel motivated to carry out acts of violence and raise fears in the communities they target. And we've saw this in the United States a lot last year, you know, obviously in the El Paso situation uh, where a young white supremacist who was influenced um, by things he was reading and something called the Great Replacement, uh, which is a theory that whites are being replaced by non-whites in various countries, you know, this, this caused him to literally go and kill um, you know, two dozen people in El Paso and injure many others. Um, so, you know, what is the climate that we are seeing that is allowing uh, this resurgence of anti-Semitism and white supremacy here in the United States and abroad? Well, we, we live in polarized societies in the U.S. and elsewhere, and there's a focus on changing demographics and a feeling um, among disaffected whites, you know, mostly in the U.S., but I think elsewhere, that that their um, you know societies and and countries are being overwhelmed by non-white immigrants from other countries, and white supremacists and anti-Semites they exploit that sentiment, and they insist that it's the Jews who are pushing for immigration, you know, touting globalism and diversity, and they're angry, and Jews. Um, are easy to scapegoat and blame for societal ills. And, you know, we saw this this year in particular with the coronavirus and QAnon. Um, we know that in the US and Europe, anti-Semites pushed the idea that the coronavirus was a tool for Jews uh, to expand their global influence. Um, and we also saw that QAnon followers, you know, who believe that a satanic cabal of um, elitists are kidnapping young children um, you know, off the streets and draining their blood. We, we see that this is like a direct correlation to the blood libel that has been generated, uh, you know, for centuries uh, in Europe. So, um, you know, and QAnon theories, which are very uniquely American in some ways, have now made their way to Europe, especially in the UK and, and, and in Germany. So uh, there's a lot to talk about with regard to these issues. And I'll conclude by saying uh, that there's a role for all of us to play uh, in combating global anti-Semitism, and it starts in our own communities and expands out into, um, you know, greater circles. And we know that, you know, all different people, political leaders and, and social media companies and educators, et cetera, um, have a role to uh, play in tamping down this extreme rhetoric and hatred that we're seeing. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn, so much. Maybe we'll turn to Germany first, Kim, and if you can kind of give us the view from the other side of the Atlantic and, and tell us a little bit about how some of the themes that Marilyn's raised here, how do they manifest themselves in Germany and what are you seeing and what are you monitoring? Yeah, thank you very much for having me here at this um, very interesting event and also to to uh, put a spotlight on the international connection on different phenomena uh, which we see here in Germany but 
uh, we already noticed uh, a long time ago, uh, let's say one or two decades, that on the two subjects I'm supposed to speak on, there is a quite important international connection. Like on the one hand, the Islamist side, and on the other hand, like the right wing, neo Nazi, and also populist side. So uh, turning first uh, to the to the um, right wing side, like in Germany in, in general, like in in the nineties we had a very strong revival of uh, neo Nazi groups and strong uh, movements from from those sides um, who attacked almost uh, regularly every day um, immigrants. Uh, uh, like people who, who didn't appear to be in, in their uh, worldview to be accepted and um, asylum seeker, refugees, uh, uh, LGBTIQ people and so on. So uh, this, is, this is not specifically something new. This is, uh, uh, I would say, to a certain extent, uh, uh, German origin, like uh, with the Nazi past. Um, but there was a revival after the reunification when the Germans felt strong again and uh, saw there's a lot possible. Um, so, but over the last um, decade, there, there has been a shift also in uh, internationalization, uh, specifically uh, with the so called populist movements uh, uh, on the right. For example, we have the AFD, which is uh, the alternative for Germany, which is uh, mainly now uh, anti-immigrant and to a certain extent also anti-Semitic uh, uh, party, which uh, tends to overcome the current state as it is. Like it's being perceived, I would say, to a certain extent, like in the US uh, with some of the populist movements, uh, that the, the state is uh, like governed by the wrong people and the elite and this anti-elitist uh, discourse and that the, um, the movement and the real people have uh, to change uh, the system and overcome the system. Um, so this is the, the, on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, we saw um, during um, terrorist attacks like the Halle attacks uh, last year uh, where, where uh, uh, right-wing uh, terrorist guy uh, tried to kill as many people in the synagogue as possible, but he, he wasn't able uh, to do so, luckily, but then he turned, mm -hmm. after being able to attack the Jews, he turned to the immigrants uh, to and uh, try to kill them. And um, also what Marilyn mentioned before, there, there has been this very strong uh, male impetus and um, yeah, let's say uh, hatred against women and uh, LGBTIQ people. Uh, so he also uh, killed a woman and so on, a random person. So this is or shot. Um, so this is something. This is something um, where I would say uh, there are some similarities from uh, internationalization, um, also in the context that. Uh, the live streaming uh, of such events is taking place now um, internationally and is uh, motivating or supposed to motivate other people to uh, repeat such actions. Um, turning to the um, Islamist chapter, um, like we, we saw in general in Europe, uh, many uh, jihadi um, attacks over the last decade and if not the first or the primary goal, um, Jewish and Israeli institutions were the second or the third target most often. Um, so um, attackers uh, might have had the first uh, um, goal to attack uh, Jewish, Jewish facilities um, or other facilities, mm. but on their list often, quite often, uh, Jewish or Israeli targets were uh, also mentioned. Um, this mainly by the uh, Sunni um, jihadists. Um, turning the eye to the Iranian threat uh, in, in Germany, we know uh, that the Iranians were spying uh, on Jewish and Israeli related targets, uh, like in preparation for potential uh, attacks, and also like the Iranian affiliate uh, Hezbollah. Um, 
are strong in, in spotting and spying uh, uh, on Jewish uh, institutions. So it's there is a real a potential um, security threat there in case of a, of a broader escalation. Um, and we, we also had um, several uh, terrorist attacks in Europe inspired from, from this area uh, um, uh, in, in the Middle East uh, over the last years. So in Germany we have a specific situation as there is a, a strong immigration community uh, coming from Turkey. Um, so coming from Turkey and um, in, in general Turkey is currently trying to mobilize with anti-Semitic tropes against Israel and implicitly uh, in general against the Jews uh, with an uh, expansionist uh, policy. So, and this affects specifically the uh, Turkish immigrant community with a nationalist and Islamist discourse by Erdogan, um, mobilizing uh, to a certain extent against the Jews. And in general, affiliated with uh, Turkey and over the uh, last years, Turkey tried to be the center of the anti-Western and anti-Israel front. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood affiliates um, in Europe are uh, being mobilized uh, in Turkey and by Turkey as well. So there were several conferences in Turkey where Muslim Brotherhood um, organizations together with Salafi Jihadi organization met specifically around the topic against Israel. So um, like in, in general what we see in Europe and in, in Germany that the mobilization um, of uh, anti-Semitism is specifically violent in Arab and Turkish discourse. Um, so in as a primary language. So this is like the the kind of internal internationalization uh, um, like compared to the to the uh, German and other European languages it's it's much better controlled like by Facebook by YouTube and others uh, than the Arabic and um, Turkish discourse here so um, this is this is one thing uh, I, I I think there, there's a cross uh, or international perspective is important what can be done there uh, because this is actually those this discourse is mobilizing directly uh, for attacks against Jews which is less taking place in in more con um, controlled languages as Germany with Facebook for example but um, mm -hmm. in general. We also are facing the, the um, problem that many, at least from the right-wingers and neo-Nazi groups, turned to the non-controlled um, uh, news channels and also to the, to the messengers uh, like Telegram, where it's much more difficult uh, to be able to counter them because they're not so controlled by the uh, European or national institutions in Europe. Okay, I'll leave right. it. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, so much. Uh, we'll turn to the UK next. Um, Dave, if you can please give your um, perspective from, from the UK and kind of how you're seeing ex exactly these themes uh, manifest uh, in the community that you're, you're monitoring and you're watching. Thank you, Sharon, and uh, thank you to the ADL for inviting me onto this panel. Um, the story of anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom over the last five years has been dominated by discussions about uh, and arguments about anti-Semitism on the left. And this has been uh, very unusual and a very strange experience for the Jewish community. Firstly, because uh, historically we're used to tackling anti-Semitism from the far right uh, and in more recent years, uh, anti-Semitism from extreme uh, jihadist and Islamist movements. Um, and now all of a sudden it was coming from the left who are supposed to be the, the anti-racist part of the political spectrum. But also because it didn't come from the extremes, uh, it came in mainstream politics. Uh, and it happened because Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party uh, five years ago, and he remained leader until April of this year. And under his leadership, uh, for various reasons, the Labour Party began to attract 
uh, people with anti-Semitic views, but with a particular type of anti-Semitic views. This was a kind of anti-Semitism that mixed up um, extreme hatred of Israel and a view of Zionism as a, a racist ideology of global power that resided not just in Israel, but in Washington and New York and London and elsewhere, mixed with a, a view of Jews as rich and right wing and not part of the progressive people, the progressive movement that, that Jeremy Corbyn, who came from a very radical part of the left wing spectrum, represented. And what happened was these ideas, this kind of, of uh, kind of almost progressive anti-Semitism, but mixed in with very old fashioned stereotypes about, about Jews and money and so on, that had always sort of hung around the fringes of the left. Uh, they flooded into mainstream politics. And Jewish people who were in the Labour Party in the UK found themselves increasingly uh, alienated, victimized, uh, harassed and, and pushed out and started to leave. There were some very high profile cases of Jewish members of parliament, especially female Jewish members of parliament, such as Luciana Berger, uh, Louise Elman, Ruth Smith and others who, who received unbelievable amounts of, of abuse and death threats and so on, some of whom left the party as a result. There were, I mean, there were thousands of, of Jewish members who had this experience. Um, and it, it, uh, it came to a head with uh, a, uh, a complaint to the UK's official uh, anti-racism regulator. We have a body in the United Kingdom called the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And they are an official uh, legal regulator that is there to enforce equalities laws in the UK. Uh, the only other political party they've ever investigated is the British National Party, which is a tiny kind of neo-fascist party. But they investigated the Labour Party. And a couple of weeks ago, they ruled that the Labour Party had broken uh, anti-discrimination law in this country. And this was a, a, a huge moment in British politics and in British Jewish life um, because uh, it was very validating for the Jewish community. And the new leadership of the Labour Party have really taken this on and are trying to bring about change. But what happened really taught us a few things about how anti-Semitism is changing. The first one is this merger of uh, anti-Semitic ideas from different extremes, kind of blurring together, mixing together in this big conspiracy soup that exists on the internet, where you will get people who consider themselves to be left-wing, who are members of left-wing movements, who see themselves as anti-racist, grabbing anti-Semitic images from literally neo-Nazi websites, posting them into their We Love Jeremy Corbyn Facebook group and getting hundreds of likes as a result and not being able to see the problem. Um, and social media played a huge part in this. Facebook groups in particular, private, hidden Facebook groups, played a radicalizing role where the people running these groups, the people dominating the discourse in these groups, would they would set the tone for any conversation about Jews, anti-Semitism, Israel, the Holocaust, anything related. And other people would either have to go along with it or they'd get squeezed out. So people would get radicalized. Um, and they would get radicalized also because they saw Jeremy Corbyn as someone they wanted to support for lots of, of positive reasons, for broader progressive politics, and if he's getting attacked for anti-Semitism, they're just going to have to defend him. So they defend their guy. And I think we see this in lots of our politics. If, if, some, if people see a leader of their guy, their leader, they will, they will basically defend pretty much anything. Right? And this is what we experienced. Um, and, of course, what we've seen this year is, is a, a much broader growth in conspiracy theories related to, to coronavirus, anti-vaccine conspiracy theories really growing. QAnon ideas coming in from the US to the UK. And anti-Semitism always finds its place. Uh, and, and, and there's this anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories provide this golden thread that links anti-Semitism to all these other political movements. Uh, and I'm afraid to say, I think it's, um, I think we have a big challenge on our hands. There was uh, an opinion poll done uh, just recently, published a couple of weeks ago in the UK by uh, an anti-fascist uh, or anti-hate uh, organisation called Hope Not Hate. And it, it was part of a big research project they did into QAnon support in the UK. But there, there was one 
question in their opinion poll that jumped out at me, and this, this is what I'm going to hand on, really. They asked the question, uh, to what extent do you agree Jews have disproportionate control of powerful institutions and use that power for their own benefit and against the good of the general population? Right? It's a standard anti-Semitic conspiracy question. What jumped out at me is that younger people were much, much more likely to agree with this than older people. There was an age break at around 40, 45 years of age. People below that age, two or three times as likely to agree as people oh. who are older. Uh, and between in the, the, the most, 30% uh, of 25 to 34 year olds agreed with that statement. Now, I think there's lots of reasons we can think about that explain this. There's the, the distance from the Holocaust and from the Second World War. There's changing perceptions of Israel over time. But I think the role of social media, the use of social media, and the, the prevalence of conspiracy theories where kids growing up today, of school age, of university age, are so familiar with conspiracy theories as just a normal way of explaining the world. And where that's the case, where you believe, of course, there's a secret rich elite running things. Anti-Semitism just has an, an easy home and a ready home. And I think we have a big challenge on our hands. Thank you, Deb, for, for that sobering uh, assessment. Um, I guess that's a perfect uh, segue now to shift our focus to Latin America and to Chile. Uh, and Sofia, maybe you can kind of set the stage for us, uh, for our audience, about um, the Jewish community of Chile uh, and what is your, uh, you know, manifestation of anti-Semitism? How does it really show itself in your community and in, in your lives? Thank you, Sharon. I'm very, very honored to be part of this panel. And a little bit of a spoiler, here my co-speakers, we have so many things in common in our communities. We have realities that are sharing. It doesn't matter that we're in different countries or different hemispheres, the reality is the same or similar. We, I, I might say that we have like a salad of everything that you just said. Uh, but first of all, let me tell you a little bit of the Chilean Jewish community. We're a very small community with 14,000 members. Uh, that means that almost one out of a thousand is Jewish in Chile. Uh, we have 14 synagogues and three day schools, so we are very small. And actually, if you have invited me to this conversation a little bit more than a year ago, I would be reporting something very different because we have had, well, you might have seen it on the news, we have a very different social and political reality. We just voted a few weeks ago a new re a referendum to write a new constitution and it passed and we're going to write it with a constitutional assembly that means that regular people are going to be in charge of writing this new constitution and this is the result of social protests that we have at the end of last year that became violent so as you see we have a this is a whole new world for us politically and socially but focusing on anti-semitism that's what brings us together uh, let me tell you, even though I'm happy to report that we haven't had any major terrorist attacks, we have had incidents of harassment and vandalism, and they're, they're escalating. Uh, the first thread that I have to lay out is the classical anti-Semitism. That is something that we can find in our general population. There is a fragile tolerance against minorities. We have had large immigration movements toward Chile, but especially towards the Jewish community. We are like the, the stars of the migration, even if we have been here for a long time. And basically what we feel is that the feeling of anti-Semitism toward us because it's because of lack of knowledge about what the Jews are in general. And whenever we work at the museum and we get visitors, we get claims, and I was listening to Mar Marilyn and this like popped in my head. Uh, we hear things like, Question, did you kill Jesus? Question, do you still t use children's blood during your ceremonies? Question, is it true that all Jews are rich? And so on and so on. This goes with the classical rhetoric, uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric. Also, when we post something on our web or on our social media, we get, for, for instance, if we post something about the Holocaust, we're going to get people saying, oh, again, you come with the holocuento, which means the hollow tale. The Holocaust is a lie. We get a lot of deniers from the uh, Holocaust deniers. And if we get to post something about the life in the ghettos, they people are going to write down, but why are you talking about ghettos that happened 
more than 80 years ago when Israel has an open sky ghetto in Palestine. So this is our reality every day. For example, other examples that when we go to schools, we have an educational resource we did based on the ADL pyramid of hate. And when we go to schools, teacher will inter the teachers interrupt us and say, how can you talk about human rights when you're harassing the Palestinians? And this goes on and on. And this only in schools. When we go to universities, we have a strong BDS movement, which I think is common to all of us and we know the consequences. And well, that, that's only in the academic world. When we move to the politi political sphere, we have extreme right that is rising. Maybe some of you saw in the news a picture of neo-Nazis parading in the streets. This was during a peaceful demonstration and this neo-Nazi group were exhibiting anti-Israeli flags and Nazi symbols and nothing happened, not even a sanction. It was just a good picture to be shown in the newspapers. Um, also, some of the members of these neo-Nazi groups that, that were in, the, in this demonstration, they're running for positions within the Constitution Assembly that's going to write our new Constitution. So we have a lot to worry on the right. But when we move to the left, well, the scenario is not, not very encouraging, though. Uh, we have a Palestinization of the left. We have a pro-Palestine support group in Congress that is conformed by 90 out of 155 members of the Chamber of Deputy. And what's more interesting, and Dave said something about this, that it's transversal. We have politicians from the right, from the center, and from the left joining into the cause of the Palestinian people, which has been uh, a way to uh, clean anti-Semitic views. Uh, last week, for example, the Senate passed a resolution that asked President Piñera to adopt a boycott law against Israel. And also, recently, the Chilean Senate sent a Palestinian ambassador here in Chile to analyze the, Palestinian, the Palestine situation. During this meeting, the Palestinian ambassador made some remarks such as, the terrorists that attack the Israeli population are martyrs and the best of us. He also said that Chilean Jews are loyal to Israel, not to Chile, while the Chilean Palestinians are loyal to Chile. And not like in the Corbyn uh, uh, case, nothing happened. He's still an ambassador. We still like him and he's gonna be in office for a while. And these hostilities are cast on to our local community. For example, last Rosh Hashanah, our community sent out jars of honey for the, for the Congress members. And some of them sent it back and said, Thank you, but we don't want your honey. Ask Israel to stop harassing the Palestinians. And also when there are news about the Middle East, again, the Jewish community is held responsible for the actions of Israel. This is enhanced, and I don't know if, uh, if the people that are listening to us know it, but we have a large Chilean Palestinian community, one of the largest outside Palestine, Palestine and with about around 400,000 members. Even though most of them are Christian, historically we have had very good relationships, but now the leadership of the Palestinian community has been radicalized in the last few decades. And they also receive a lot of support from the media, groups of artists and opinion leaders. So for instance, just to give you an example, last week, a Palestinian activist attending a program about memory, history and justice organized by our National Memorial Museum, managed to cancel the course because during the first session, the non-Jewish speaker had claimed that the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust were genocides. In a, in a later interview, the activist argued that the Memorial Museum is victim to Zionist pressure to mention the Holocaust. That's only in our local uh, scenario. When we move forward to a regional scenario, we have, uh, that's what we we're discussing today. We have the triple frontier between Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil, that's very near to us, which is a hotspot for Hezbollah activities. And these cells in the triple frontier are allegedly involved to the army attack in Argentina more than 25 years ago. Um, that is why we have been monitoring the growth of the Shiite community in the northern part of Chile for possible nexus with these cells in the triple frontier. So 
I, I, I'm going to leave the conspiracy theories because we have our own conspiracy theory that I want to speak about, but let's uh, get into the conversation and I'm going to get to that. But as you can see, we have been harassed. Our walls have been sprayed with anti-Semitic graffitis. Uh, the, there are media attacks, pro-Palestinian campaign, campaigns, and all of this is growing because we have a poor legislation against hate crimes. Our first law against hate crimes was passed on 2012, and it has centered its, its actions in the protection of sexual minority, sorry, sexual minorities, but not really into anti-Semitism. And you can see that because Chile hasn't adopted the IRA definition. And actually, there is a normalization of hate, especially disguised under the anti-Zionist label, because that is politically correct to be said. Not, not only, of course, you cannot say that you hate the Jews, but you can say that you're anti-Zionist and that would be okay. There are micro-discriminations a, on a daily basis and jokes are not stopped. And as you can see, we have a hostile environment that is building up. And well, we hope that with education and the writing of this new constitution, we can get to a better scenario. Um, so Thank that's- Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Sophia. That's, that's tremendous. And I think a lot of information that most of our audience members don't really have access to. So thank you for bringing those to light for us. Um, obviously, when we discuss all of these issues, um, the primary concern, and for us at ADL as well, is the security and physical security of the Jewish community. And I know that each of you, with your own organizations and your own uh, daily activities, That is a prime concern. So maybe, Dave, I'll turn to you next and talk li literally about what are your concerns about physical safety of the Jewish community of UK and really link what we see as conspiracy theories turn into physical acts of violence. Conspiracy theories don't just stay in an idea space and on, the, and on social media uh, platforms. They do uh, kind of manifest and turn themselves into acts of violence, uh, especially when we see through our report that um, uh, terrorists or extremists are literally um, reciting the manifestos written by one uh, attacker in one country. They're lifting up that language, using it in the, perpetrating their own acts of violence. So they're influencing one another, they're copying one another. So if you could talk to us a little, little bit about CST and kind of how you view the physical security of the community and how do you, you know, tackle you know, the two the, 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 the things that influence And, and radicalize um, lone wolves or others who do perpetrate acts of violence? Look, sadly, tragically, uh, the uh, terrorist threat to Jewish communities is all too familiar to all of us uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, we saw it in Vienna just last week uh, with a terrorist attack that began at uh, one of the main synagogues there. Uh, we don't yet know if the synagogue was Uh, supposed to be part of the attack or not, but it, that's where it began. Uh, fortunately, the building was, was closed uh, and there was nobody in it. But we've seen it repeatedly uh, in Europe and, of course, in the United States. Um, and we have the same uh, situation in the United Kingdom, um, whereby the, the, the tempo of, of the frequency of terrorist plots being foiled by the police just keeps going and going and going. Uh, I think uh, the police recently announced in the last three years they've foiled, I think, 27 different terrorist plots, uh, a mixture of far-right and jihadist. I think more jihadist, but increasingly uh, the number of far-right plots are, 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 are stepping up. And of course, then there are the others that, that get through. Um, and what we increasingly see is that even in the plots that do not directly target the Jewish community, there will be evidence of anti-Semitic ideology, anti-Semitic views and conspiracy theories when the police uh, dig down into the ideological motivation and the online activities of these terrorists and, and would-be terrorists, whichever political uh, background or, or ideology they come from. Um, and I think the... Uh, you know, as, as Marilyn explained earlier, the, the, the far-right terrorist threat is this very difficult combination of, on the one hand, people acting alone when they carry out an attack. But even though they act alone, they view themselves and they exist as part of a global movement. 
that feed off each other, encourage each other, glorify each other. When they carry out the attacks, they write a manifesto and they film the attack as they're doing it because they know that means they will be memorialized online on all these social media platforms to then encourage the next attack and the one after that and the one after that. It's a very different model from what we've seen with, with uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda where for all that ISIS tried to encourage this kind of, of lone wolf activity, this kind of spontaneous proactive uh, activity in support of ISIS, they still had a, they had a base, they had a center, they had a core, a media core. Um, and we've seen a decline in ISIS activity as that was uh, degraded in Syria and Iraq. What's going on in the far right is very different. There's nowhere to, to really focus on in that way. And it's much more uh, self-sustaining and therefore more threatening. Um, we see in the UK uh, not just an increase in um, this kind of far-right terror activity, but really worryingly, the, the ages of the people now being arrested for planning terrorist attacks are getting younger and younger. In the last year, we've had a series of 16, 17-year-olds going through the courts. Um, they all have an online footprint. It's just, it's just part of it now. Um, so, the, you know, in terms of, of the, the, the safety and security of the Jewish community in, in the United Kingdom, this is the threat. The threat is obvious. It's apparent. And, and we are every day doing what we can to anticipate, to preempt uh, where the threat is coming from, to protect our community from it. We get fantastic support from the government, I have to say. Uh, the UK government provides uh, about £14 million a year to pay for security guards, uh, commercial security guards at Jewish schools and synagogues and other buildings. Um, the cooperation with the Home Office and the police, uh, counter-terrorist police, hate crime police and others is really excellent. Um, and this is something that that uh, really is, is cross-party as well, certainly since April has been fully cross-party. So on that side, we have the support we need, but we know, you know, it, it, they only have to get lucky once, as the saying goes, and this is this is an ongoing threat to the community. Tim, uh, do you feel that Germany is also well positioned to kind of respond to the kind of physical threats that are um, kind of facing the, the Jewish community and broader society, and, and how would you depict kind of this, uh, the efforts to protect Jewish communal life in Germany and, and it sounds like the German government does say the right things, but does it actually do the right steps to protect the community? And what are, where are your concerns physically? Um, okay, like my, my position, how I'm speaking here is, of course, not, uh, it's, it's from a research institute. I'm, I'm not responsible for the security of the Jewish community as, it, um, as, as the CST, for example, which is much deeper uh, in, in the whole field there. Um, but um, I, I, I think one, one can say that in general, uh, those buildings which are being protected by police, um, they're much more secured than those areas uh, which are left without uh, police protection. So especially in uh, smaller communities, um, in uh, certain uh, schools, um, there's not enough protection as there should be. Um, having said this, uh, we, we luckily um, haven't had that many terrorist attacks uh, happening in Germany against uh, Jewish institutions uh, over the last years. Uh, but what is, uh, uh, let's say, the everyday threat um, stemming from many two uh, fields um, of society like the neo-Nazi groups and more Islamists or to a certain extent also people with a Muslim background who wouldn't say about themselves that they are not Islamists um, but even though would attack uh, Jews or uh, Jewish Israelis or Israelis um, so from th those two corners uh, we, we usually see uh, anti-Semitic incidents uh, there where there's an overlapping of a, a larger Jewish or visible Jewish uh, population and a concentration of neo-Nazi groups or in areas where there is a larger um, uh, immigrant community. 
So um, there, there is this everyday um, threat beside the um, terror threat as such. And the, the last point I, I want uh, to say there is um, like the whole environment which makes Jews also feel unsafe in Germany. And this, of course, it's not just the, the physical attacks, but it's the overall uh, discourse. It's very visible now, uh, the topic of um, uh, terrorist threats or uh, other anti-Semitic attacks um, over the last years. So it creates an unsafe feeling in the, in the overall uh, community in Germany. So beside that, it's also uh, everything related uh, to Israel. If, if you just um, don't want to mention that you're Jewish uh, at your workspace, for example, because people would then mention something about Israel, and what uh, the Jews do in Israel and so on. This is not a very good situation uh, Jews are facing in Germany. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. I guess that's the same experience, uh, Sofia, that you mentioned for the Jewish community in Chile, where you all felt like you are held responsible for policy decisions being made in Jerusalem. Um, but what are your concerns about the physical safety of the community? And where do those threats, if any, where do they emanate from? And uh, and really, what, what are your real concerns on a day-to-day -day basis? As you send your kids to school, to Jewish day school, what, what are the concerns of the community physically? So as I said before, we haven't had any terrorist attack, but that doesn't mean that we're not uh, aware that this is a possibility because the terrorist groups work as a network internationally. So we just have to look at Argentina and they have had two uh, major terrorist attacks in their, in their history. So we, are, we pay attention to these threats, their security, but I'm not, I'm not in that area. But what I can say is that we have uh, the, the atmosphere around it, it's building up. When we have a mayor that says openly that we control the media, or he says into a newspaper, uh, I have problems with the Zionist community here in Chile, you see that the, the scenario is building up for a threat, maybe not a terrorist threat, but a lone wolf can get a hold of these ideas and as i told you before we for instance we have our own conspiracy theory which is the uh, planandinia which is the latinization of the protocols of Zion, which says that taking what herzl wrote in his book on the at the end of the 19th century of the 20th century sorry he said uh, that uh, that maybe we could go and live in argentina and uh, well, they take that, that idea and a Nazi in the 70s made a whole conspiracy theory that said that we are trying to conquer the Chilean and, and Argentinian Patagonia to create a new state. So for example, we have members of the Senate asking to get the numbers of tourists, Israeli tourists that are coming to our country and saying that they wanna know because they're sure that these are covered missions that Israel is sending soldiers to recognize what we want to become our, uh, the new state of the uh, Jewish people. So I think, uh, Sharon, that our major threat is that there is, as I said, there's no law uh, around this. People can go and say this thing and the, gro the hate is growing. Our security agency has asked for people not to go out in the streets with a with a yamaka on. So I think like we are a stage before that what we're seeing in in Europe and we hope that we can stop it. But we we see that the hostilities are growing and uh, that the the whole atmosphere is less tolerant to us as a community. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Maybe our last round, uh, we can end on, on a hopeful note. And I'd really like to start with you, Marilyn, since so much of our research is really looking at uh, negative trends. Um, let's, let's just talk a little bit about solutions, talk a little bit about hope. In your area, and I'll go around and ask, starting with Marilyn, where do you see uh, solutions lying in some of the challenges that have been highlighted in this panel? 
or do you see any play areas of hope that things are moving actually in the right direction? I, you know, take, pick, take your pick, whichever you want, either solutions or kind of a hopeful trend that you can share with us, Marilyn. Sure. Well, one of the things that um, that I do see, uh, I mean, you know, this panel is an example. Um, I know that uh, I at ADL, I work with our colleagues in other countries in your in, you know, in Europe that are combating extremism. And, and it's what I said in my opening remarks. I do feel that there is a greater awareness um, of the fact that, um, you know, anti-Semitism is on the rise, um, not, you know, in the United States and in Europe. And I think that there's a sense that it has to be, um, you know, dealt with, you know, on some level. And so, you know, it's obviously very, very important to get the support of, you know, not only the government, you know, government, you know, in terms of like denouncing anti-Semitism, uh, but also, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think, you know, because so much of what we're seeing is, people connecting through social media. It, it's very important for social media companies to play a role in stopping hatred online because that's where it's festering, that's where it starts, and that's where it then leads to um, you know, people actually taking real life action. And we've seen this, and, and I know that um, uh, my, my colleagues here have mentioned the fact that people live stream, Brett and Tarrant, um, and um, you know, the, 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 the guy, the attacker in Holly, of the Holly Synagogue and, and others have, have tried to live stream their events and Brent and Taryn succeeded so that they can influence others. So I think there's a, there's a role to play by these companies. So I see that um, even though I think it's been very difficult to get these companies to respond in the way we would like, um, they are taking steps. Unfortunately, um, I, I want to be positive, but you know, once you know, Facebook and Twitter can take down accounts, and then they just go to Parler and Telegram. You know, the extremists. So you know, it's it has to be a uh, an effort on the part of lots of different people in society. You know, law enforcement, educators, um, you know, politicians, everybody working together. And I think that there's a desire for that to happen. And so I'm I'm looking on the positive side of that. And I think you know, ADL has. Um, you've done a lot of work around the social media companies, and I know that we are, um, I know for myself with the Center on Extremism, we know how important it is to reach out to allies here in the United States and also abroad to work together to fight, you know, anti-Semitism and extremism. Well, um, uh, Kim, any quick, hopeful, or solutions that you want to share with our audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think um, there 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 where some things happened over the last five years uh, in Germany and also to a certain extent uh, in Europe, which which heads towards uh, in in a good direction, like uh, beside the bad things happening. So this is uh, the whole aspect on uh, hate crimes legislation changes there. There are um, the whole regulation of hate speech in social media, uh, the aspect of implementing the IRA definition uh, in European countries, uh, the aspect of um, uh, starting with national action plans against uh, anti-Semitism, uh, which will come uh, over the na next years in several European countries. So there, there are certain good developments beside the um, different threats and uh, attacks and whatever things we, we are facing. So they're Thanks. also good. Absolutely. Uh, Dave, anything you want to add? Hopeful signs or solutions? Just what, what I began with really when I talked about the anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and that the, the UK's equalities watchdog or, or regulator ruled uh, that the party had, had broken the law. As terrible as it is that they broke the law, uh, the fact is uh, that the law protected us in that situation. You know, this is this this body is an important democratic institution in the UK, and it worked. Democratic institutions, democratic laws, anti-discrimination laws are there. Uh, they have power, and they work to protect the Jewish community. And the Labour Party now, I, I believe, is on a much more positive track. So I, I I don't think we'll see the same problems from that particular source as we have done over previous years. That's great. And Sophia, you get the last word of hope or solutions. 
Well, actually, in my line of work, we, we work in the museum with students, and we feel like education, education, education is the key to a solution. We have to tackle this problem with the young generations. We have to let them see that hate doesn't give us anything. And we, we try to work a lot with underprivileged students so that we can level the opportunities to know us also, and not only us, the, all the minorities. Uh, we feel that we have to open up for people to know us a little bit better. And I think that there are two things that are very important. Of course, legislation is important, but I feel that now we are talking about uh, networks that work for the bad, and we can create networks that work to make this better. And I think that this panel is an example of that. We've created a uh, Latin American network for institutions that are studying and working with students around the teachings of the Holocaust. So I feel that there's hope, there's a lot of work to be done. And, but as your ADL report said that your last report, people that were exposed to knowing what the Holocaust is about, they're more empathic, they're more open to, to a multicultural society. So I think like, yeah, we have a lot of problems, but there is hope. And I think that working together, we can do this a better, you know, we have a better outcome. Well, on that wonderful, positive note, I want to thank this really wonderful panel. Thank you for taking time to be with us. Thank you so much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.